Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, an STS special. We bring you a series called Surviving My Biggest Case, and you're in for a treat today. Our best guest is none other than Johnny Grusing. He spent 25 years as an FBI special agent where he investigated international terrorism, espionage, bank robberies, kidnappings, serial murders, special jurisdiction crimes, missing persons, public corruption, and other violent crime matters. He was also involved in multiple high-profile cases and studied behavior analysis, not to mention starring as a college basketball player playing guard for Texas Tech. Don't let those humble looks fool you. The guy tore it up on the court. Uh, Johnny, great to have you back. We haven't had you back uh, enough, but I will change that soon enough. Um, before we even get going, uh, I think you told me you were a shooting guard. Is that right? Yeah, that's mainly the only way I got to play any college basketball was learning how to shoot the ball. So uh, not not much defense here, Joel, but uh, was able to shoot the three a little bit. So and, and I know that you uh, you work with uh, kids. Uh, are you able to go on a court today with, let's say, an 18 year old and teach them a humble lesson still? Hmm. It really depends on the 18 year old. You know, <laughs> I, I, I am still very competitive. So if I play a, a someone that's 20, 30 years younger than me, I, I tell them my age, tell them <laughs> that, you know, they're in for a treat and, you know, they tend not to guard me so I can get off a quick three before they just shut me down, you know, but. And how is that? A, is a jumper still effective? It's not as high of a jumper, but it's, yeah, I, I think I leave the ground for about a half second nowadays, maybe a quarter. <laughs> um, so what got you, um, obviously, you know, anytime you're a big time college athlete, you know, you get some attention and you went down, um, an interesting path. You became an FBI agent. What got you interested in uh, working for the uh, for the feds? So w when I was at Tech, I just went straight through to get a master's degree. I had thought, Joel, that uh, playing college ball and getting a business degree would be a ticket to, you know, big bucks, but <laughs> didn't really have any offers coming out. Uh, the economy was kind of tight back then. And so I just went ahead and got a master's while I was in grad school. At a career fair, I met an FBI agent. He had a little desk set up there, and he had actually run track for Texas. Uh, and I was fascinated by him. He's like, you can you can still kind of be an athlete, and yet have a job that means something. I watched a little video back then as a VHS tape, and some of your listeners won't even know what the heck that thing is, but <laughs> it, it uh, talks about that you might have to use deadly force, or it might be used against you. It's like, here's the real deal. There's kind of a wake up call like this isn't what you see on TV. But I, I still wasn't deterred by it just because I want to have uh, I want to have a job that's challenging and means something. And that's what we talked about. And yeah. uh, I uh, kept his card for four years. I went to work insurance in Dallas uh, for a company that would hire me. But every day I would look at that business card and then just wonder if I could ever do something like that. And I got in took me a year to get in the FBI once I, I kept talk, calling the agent and his name was Greg, wondering if it's time to apply. And he said, yeah, you probably got enough experience now after three years, you should apply. And so uh, by the grace of God, I got in, went to Quantico. We think it's like a price is right wheel they spin to see where you're going to land. And I landed <laughs> here in Denver. And it's been a great career for me. Wow. Um and so you literally held on to that card um, for all that time. And uh, what was uh, kind of the turning point where you just sick of the insurance business and said, uh, let, let me let me go chase this card out of my desk and give this guy a call? Yeah, it was pretty boring for me. Uh, it, it was interesting, you know, learning a new business and stuff. But by year three, uh, they had asked us not to write much new business. 
Uh, it was the company was not doing very well, and so they said, "Let's just stay with the risk we have." So they were paying me to do almost nothing, and that's not. I like to be busy. So uh, by Thursdays, my wife would uh, just give me the hand when I would come in the door and say, Johnny, go for a run, and then we'll talk. Because <laughs> I, was, I was very frustrated with not having a job that had purpose and meaning. I didn't like just getting paid not to do anything. So uh, uh-huh. yeah, I eventually called Greg back. That was about the time I did it. I'm very much the same way. It sounds like we married a very similar uh, woman. Um, because I get the hand too. I just got the hand. And uh, I apologize for these ambient, these beautiful ambient sounds. I am moving into my studio, but still right now I get the mellifluous sound of the landscaper in the background. So uh, that is what we are hearing. Hopefully uh, that person will be done very quickly. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting because you go from one team sport, the FBI and law enforcement is very much uh, a team effort. Uh, did you find that right away when you got into the agency? I did. Uh, you go through as a class, so it was 50 of us, and then we all get assigned to different uh, divisions, they call them. So one another classmate named Scott and I got assigned to Denver, but then you get assigned to a squad once you're there, and a squad consists of anywhere from six to eight. Back then, it was just FBI agents to where you work a violation. I started out in counterterrorism. Uh, not long after I got there, 9-11 happened, just a couple of years. And 9-11 changed the way we f- even formed squads into where we, a squad then would consist of our local law enforcement partners as well. So as, as you probably know, the FBI missed some warning signs and some puzzle pieces for 9-11. And uh, we found that if we'd been communicating well with our local law enforcement and federal partners, we might have prevented it. So we started forming task forces. And shortly after 9-11, I was uh, on a violent crime task force. And that's where I spent a, the majority of my FBI time. Hmm. So... You know, this show is all about its title, Surviving My Biggest Case. Um, Is there sort of a seminal case in your career? And just for full transparency, we don't really discuss this ahead of time. I just uh, know you're legit. And I said, hey, Johnny, do you want to share a story? So uh, curious to hear which it is or what it is uh, in terms of the case that sort of defined your career. Yeah, Joel. So uh, for the first five years, uh, six, eight years, I was on the violent crime squad. I primarily handled bank robberies, fugitives, uh, kidnapping, some missing person cases, but they were cases that the longest one might last six months, a year or so, till we could either figure out who it was or not, because they weren't very complex crimes. Uh, mm-hmm. 2006, though, I can still remember where where I was at my desk uh, is November 2006 when my boss called me in. I was the only one on the squad there that day. He said, hey, Grusin, get in the office. It's like, okay. His name's Phil. Phil's a big guy, 6'4". He played football and, you know, big hands, a lot bigger than mine. <laughs> but uh, uh, Phil called me in and said, uh, hey, sit down. Uh, we got a problem. I said, Okay. He said, yeah, I just talked to two dads, and I think our informant, the FBI informant, killed both their daughters. Uh, They're missing. And he goes, "Uh, whatever cases you have, you need to push to the side because I'm assigning you this case. Mm -hmm. And it was a case involving our informant's name was Scott Kimball. I knew of him. I had actually met him once when I had paid him with the agent who was handling him for three years. The agent's name was Carl. I'd met him once at a Starbucks, but That's about it. And I thought he was a intelligent, kind of quirky, middle-aged dude, seems smart. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're an informant for the FBI, you're not necessarily going to be smart, but you're going to be quirky because who wants to be an informant for the FBI, right? Exactly. So this is just just taking a half step back, so I'm slow on the uptake. So it's November 2006. Uh, You're alone. You've got your squad, just like in basketball, but you're alone in the office, the big boss with the big hands, he calls you in. Uh, this guy, Scott Kimball, was, was I guess, a criminal at one point uh, who was now working for you guys to help you get intelligence. Is that right? That's it. They were, they, okay. were, they were called murder for hire cases. So Scott got 
locked up a bunch because he was stealing from people all the time, check fraud, forgery, uh, all sorts of any, any ways he could think of to steal from someone else he would. But those, mm -hmm. those crimes don't land you in jail for very long. Mm -hmm. But he started reporting up in Alaska to the FBI there, then to Seattle, and then he got transferred down to Denver, three different divisions. He would report on these murder for hires that originated out of the prison where people will get killed on the outside if Scott didn't intervene. Mm -hmm. So that's what the agent Carl was working. And that's when I met to pay Scott that one time. And what would Scott get in return for his services? How does that work? Uh, normally, um, something like Scott, you pay for his expenses, if he's having to drive around for us, if he's having to buy meals to meet with these supposed killers, uh, mm -hmm. and then just a couple of hundred bucks for his time. But mm -hmm. since he was on the books for three years, he got a couple thousand bucks, if not more. You know, he was, and he was, as he was given information to three different offices, he was getting paid for three different type cases. Wow. And so you did meet him prior to this sit down with your boss. And when you met him, what was your first impression? Just quirky dude? Yeah. Just seemed like a middle-aged kind of nothing. Yeah. You, I mean, just your average, if you, if you would just line up 50 white average middle-aged guys and say, which one is dangerous? I would say he'd be like in the forties that you would guess. All right. He's dangerous because he doesn't look, he's a, by then, Joel, I think he had killed anywhere from 20 to 40 people. And we're, we're, we're sitting down just having coffee with him. And he just seems like the, a guy that's really trying to help FBI. Wow. So tell me what your boss says to you again. He says, we've got a problem. Who, who does he think has been killed now? So two dads came in, their names are Bob, uh, Markham and Rob McLeod, their daughters had been missing for three years by 2006. Both disappeared in 2003. They met by happenstance and by them both becoming investigators on their own, figuring out what happened to their daughters. Once they meet, the common denominator of who was last with their daughters was Scott Kimball. And Bob knew that Scott was an FBI informant. That's what brought them to our porch. Rob had heard about it, but didn't know for sure. And what was Scott doing meeting both these guys' daughters? And how old were these girls or women? Uh, Casey McLeod was 18, and Jennifer Markham was 24, 25. In that. Okay. And what was Scott, did Scott have like another business or any reason to be around these two women? Scott was engaged to Casey's mom, Rob's ex-wife. So Casey's the 19 year old. So he's mm -hmm. dating seriously mom about to marry her when he takes and kills the 19, 18 year old turning 19 year old daughter. And, wow. and then with Jennifer, he was actually reporting to the FBI that Jennifer was involved in one of these murder for hire plots where he was supposedly trying to save people like Jennifer, but he actually killed her. And obviously you don't know any of this. So Big boss calls you in. He says, I think we have a problem. And your boss is saying that because these two dads found this common denominator. So then how do you, how do you proceed from there? Uh, well, the agent before me had a, a big, big box with, it's called it a stick file. Cause you'll put stuff into the computer, you know, you'll upload your reports but you'll also keep all your notes and your typed reports and whatever in your file just to have. So we, I, I grabbed this stick box full of uh, all these different notes and printouts, start going through it, and I see breadcrumbs for both of these. I see Casey went missing, and that it's miss, it's a detective had called Carl in the file and said, yeah, Casey's missing, and this is the daughter of the woman Scott's married to. There's a communication. And then Jennifer about her supposedly catching a plane to New York. And then I see, I call the detective after that. And his name's Gary Thatcher. We became close friends through this. We worked this every day for three years together. I, I was able to push my other cases aside. But uh, Gary's like, yeah, these, these two, because uh, Gary was looking at Scott for all this check fraud forgery stuff out of the Lafayette Police Department. Mm -hmm. And he talked with Lori, Casey's mom, you know, now Casey's been missing for almost 
little over two years when Gary first calls her. Uh, again, a local detective just looking at Scott defrauding people from checks. Uh, mm -hmm. Scott's locked up now for multiple violations of federal probation and check fraud forgery and whatever. So when, when Gary talks to Lori, he's like, uh, what's Scott do for a living? Same thing you said. He, she goes, well, kind of jack of all trades, a cattle man, rancher, uh, but primarily he works for the FBI. He was like, what does he do? She goes, ah. she didn't know whether he's an agent or an informant. And we hope there's a difference. There, there really <laughs> is, Joel. But uh, she did. So cool. Yeah, but Scott kept everybody confused on what that line is between an agent and an informant. So mm -hmm. some people thought he was an agent, but it's not good. Like I told you, not, not, not many people want to be an informant because they see you as a betrayer to anybody. You're, you're ratting on someone. And you're getting something in return for betraying those people around you. So he didn't advertise he was an informant. He insinuated he was FBI agent. Yeah, and that's that's a big uh, no no in in uh, the criminal world. Obviously, is to rat people out. Um, so where is Scott? Is Scott Kimball from the Denver area? Um, do you start to look into you know his past and where he's been? I mean, obviously, at this point, still. You just are concerned about the, you're focused on these two missing women, but you told me a little while ago that he's responsible for killing somewhere between 20 and 40 people. Um, that's a serious serial killer right there. Um, I guess my question is, when did you start to realize this? First question is, where is he from? Like, where is he from originally? Let's start there. I uh, grew up in Lafayette, near the Boulder area. So about 20 miles northwest of Denver. And his uh, mom and dad got divorced when he was young. Dad moved up to Montana, remarried. So Scott bounced back and forth between Hamilton, Montana and Lafayette growing up through his teenage years. And then he, no. go ahead. No, I'm always curious. Uh, like, did he have a rough upbringing? Was he, you know, abused by his dad? Anything along those lines that you start to find out? That's a long story. Uh, <laughs> well, well, it's, it's, uh, with Scott, one of the prosecutors called it Operation Snowball, to where if you start looking in a certain vein with him, it's just like the ceiling comes down because that's a very simple question. And yet my, my answer would take about 10 minutes to explain. The very short uh, answer to your question is he alleged there was sexual abuse from a neighbor and that that neighbor spent seven years in prison. Because of Scott's testimony, when Scott turned 21, he tried to kill himself, shot himself close in the head or close to it. His brother says it was a cry for attention, which I agree, because Scott wouldn't miss. He was a hunter. If he wanted to kill himself, he would have. But after that, uh, he says my uh, neighbor, our, our next door neighbor, who uh, did have Scott and his brother and cousins growing up, uh, sexually assaulted me numerous times. I don't know for sure today, Joel, if that happened, because I the reason why I'm presenting this case to you or telling you about this case is I spent 15 years with this man. From 2006 to 2021, my life was Scott Kimball. Uh, he, he, I didn't work it solely that time. For three years, it was very concentrated. Till 2009, we convicted him of four homicides. But from 2009 to 2021, he had me like a um, a cat has a ball of yarn because uh, mm -hmm. he knew that I would keep investigating because we still couldn't find Jennifer. Even after the plea agreement, he pled guilty to killing Jennifer. He's a game player and he's a master game player. And he knew wow. that I was on the hook with Jennifer's parents to find her and that these other victims had come up in this. And I was his as play toy, basically. So he would write me letters from prison. Uh, he went by the name Hannibal in prison, like Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> and appropriate. That, yeah, but he would follow also me because I, I worked some pretty prolific cases here and awful cases here in Denver. And he would write me letters on how to solve them as well. So, and, and he had some good advice sometimes, you know. I was going to just ask. <laughs> his advice probably was pretty good. Um, where, where is Scott right now before we go back in time? So he got transferred as I was retiring, which I retired two years ago. He 
got transferred to Florida. The two had nothing to do with each other. He had been such a problematic inmate for Colorado Department of Corrections. They shipped him out of state to Florida, and he since got transferred again. I believe he's up in Kentucky right now. Why? I mean, I could ask you so many questions, but why was he such a problematic inmate? I mean, was he violent in prison or was he just causing other sorts of problems? He's not violent in prison, but in prison, he resorts to what he was so good at, and that is manipulating and stealing from people. And he will steal. If he can't steal your money, he's, he'll steal your job. He'll get you fired, your, your uh, reputation, and he'll just have you turned around and upside down before you know it. So he loves, it's like a, putting a shark in a fish tank. Whenever you put Scott in a new environment, they don't know who they're dealing with. And so he did that to Colorado DOC for years and years. And I would help, I would come in and intervene and myself and the inspector generals would interview him. And it's, yeah, that was a whole different side of my life of trying to keep him from getting people fired or sending people like missiles out of the prison to go kill people, actual murder for hires, and just enjoying all the chaos you create. It's so interesting to me because I know you're a family man, you're married, but then this guy becomes literally like sort of a dysfunctional part of your existence, you know, part of your family in a weird, bizarre, twisted way. But um, so going back now in time to 2006, your your big boss is fearful, there's stuff going on. And then how do you proceed from there and then what's your kind of your first big break that makes you realize this guy is up to no good like real no good here yeah so i team up with the local detective gary and like i told you we actually became close friends through this because gary had already been investigating the check fraud forgery i told gary my mission to the fbi to see if scott killed these girls while he was our informant and if so how'd he do it what happened uh so i start really investigating Scott. I also go listen to an interview of Bob Markham. Bob is Jennifer's dad. Bob had turned into, and I've saw this, Joel, in other cases. Uh, if you have a family member go missing or it's an unsolved homicide, the dad, sometimes the mom, becomes a, a detective. And mm -hmm. if, the, if law enforcement's not helping them, they become hellbent on finding out what happened. And that's what happened with Bob because he wasn't getting help from the FBI or local departments. And every road that Bob kept going down led to Scott Kimball. And so then he would knock on the FBI door. The agent would say, we got this. Don't worry about it. And then he would try another avenue and come back around. And I, I watched him interview with Denver police homicide detectives. And that's where I learned from Bob how much work he had put in over three years and that Scott was the real deal. You know, that this just wasn't an informant who was fooling people. This was a, probably a killer. And I had just worked bank robbery cases, missing people, you know, some some homicide, but nothing like this. So I went back to Phil, my boss, and said, what do you think? And he goes, you should call the profiling unit. They'd be real interested. So I did. Mm -hmm. And they connected me with the profiler. Uh, he's speaking of profiling. He keeps a very low profile, so he doesn't want me to mention his name, even though I have, you know, uh, mm -hmm. talked about him. But I learned so much from him. I, uh, he spent eight years with me looking at this man. And he had a wealth of experience. Uh, he had worked violent crime for 20 years, been a profiler for like five, and he was fantastic. And he mm -hmm. said, Johnny, we got to turn this from a missing person case to a homicide case because people just disappeared around Scott. By now I knew his uncle had disappeared. His uncle had come to visit him. And this was a year after these two girls disappeared. Uncle came to visit him and just vanished into thin air. And... Uh, left Scott, his truck, his trailer, the two dogs disappeared along with Uncle Terry. But Scott just had everybody believing that Terry just won the lottery and moved to Mexico with a stripper named Ginger. And, and well, <laughs> that's a good day for Terry, you know. But, makes a good story, but I would still take my dog. So that's where uh, Scott, you know, I would have questioned that from Scott. Um, wow. So I imagine like, during the course of this whole investigation, there's a lot of times where you're kind of going back to that initial Starbucks meeting going, could this average looking white dude, for lack of a better description, really be this heinous of a killer? So you're probably bumping into that. But um, 
And that coupled with the fact that this guy sounds like he was smart and knew how to cover his tracks. Um, did you say one of these two women who originally went missing in 2000, where you found out about 2006, still ha has not been found? Is that right? That's correct. Wow. Wow. Um, so how much is, once you get into it, uh, you know, you talked about being bored in the insurance business. How um, unbored are you at this point where you're just preoccupied uh, in your, I mean, are you like literally sitting at your dinner table uh, thinking about Scott Kimball while your kids are talking about, you know, their homework. You can be honest with me here. Yeah, I can. So my <laughs> wife, Joe's a middle school teacher and, uh, she would come home and vomit on me about what her middle school kids that day. So that gave me the chance to vomit up Scott Kimball, you know, at the <laughs> table. And again, the, the murder stuff, we didn't know, but we just know that he would lie and manipulate. And, and the more people I started interviewing about him. So I would go to, former cellmates that would be screwed over by him and then neighbors. And finally, I worked in closer to get that family uh, while he's in jail to interview them. And I just found out that everything about him is deceit, lie, manipulation. With the cellmates, though, he would talk about murder. But he wouldn't talk about murder. He did. It was more hypothetical murders. And that's how he got the nickname Hannibal, because murder was on his brain all the time. Uh, so, yeah, I would have to process through with this. and. Uh, I thought it was really warping my kids to the point they were going to need therapy, you know, but <laughs> the nice thing is we didn't have to watch true crime in the house, yeah. you know, N none yeah. of the 48 yeah. hours or stuff like that. But uh, yeah, no, you, I, didn't, you didn't need Dateline. Um, so when I guess my question is, when did you like in earnest, when did you realize you had like a serious, serious case on your hands, here, you know, that needed tons of investigating? Uh, when. When right away, when Phil told me, when my boss says, you got to move your other cases aside, because that's a big deal. You don't just reassign cases if you're not doing anything. That's like, you know, uh, a major case for the FBI is when that happens. And, and Phil had been around enough and he worked violent crime a lot to know. And, and if Phil tells me you got to move your other cases aside and this is all you're assigned, that's when you know, like, OK, <laughs> this is something huge. Wow. Uh, um. So, so take me down this road a little bit further. It's 2006 when, when, you know, 2000, when do you, when do you get him? When do you, I guess, when are you able to bring homicide charges for the first time? So, and, and yeah. So uh, we, we worked with prosecutors, Gary and I did. He worked with local DAs. I worked with federal prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh, we charged him federally while he was still sitting in jail in Montana for possession of a firearm while he's a felon. So when he was running around pretending to be an FBI guy, we were able to hunt down this gun that a friend was holding for him behind a fish tank in San Bernardino, California, in a closet. And uh, the friend had been blackmailed by Scott. So we had to get around that. We, we get the guns and we're like, okay. And then we start down this road of charging him for felon in possession. Now that holds him while we're doing our murder charge. And then we start getting in front of him and start this uh, game playing with him of what happened to Jennifer, Casey, and Uncle Terry. And while he's giving us, he's, he likes to give little clues, but not confess to anything. Uh, he gave us a clue of Casey being on national forest land, which isn't really a clue, Joel, because ha most of Colorado's national forest land. But uh, Casey's mom, Lori, had given us a box of a bag of trash that she had kept from Scott, and it had a bunch of his receipts. Uh, one receipt was up in Walden, which is National Forest. I'd already known that Scott had gone there when Casey disappeared, but uh, if if she was if she had been found, uh, she would have been a hit DNA wise because I had Casey's DNA in the system. Do you know what that mm -hmm. means? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but um. At this point, again, it's just Jennifer, Casey, and Uncle Terry that you're focused on. Correct. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So you're not aware, because again, you've said somewhere between 20 and 40, possibly. So that means there's 17 to whatever the math is remaining. Um, when he told you that, you know, he mentions the, the forest land, is there an implication there of guilt? Is he telling mm -hmm. you, yes, I did do this? No, he's saying, what if? Because there were prosecutors present. What if one of these girls you're looking for is on National Forest land? And 
the implication is that if we find one of his victims there, could he do federal time? Because Scott wanted to be in a federal prison, not a state prison. <laughs> yeah, that, that's his game playing stuff. So, I mean, let me ask you, you're obviously, an, I mean, you seem like an easy going, but I can tell you that you're very competitive and very intense. So how did these interviews, uh, I don't want to call it an interrogation. Uh, I've got Detective Phil Waters every Friday who's investigated 400 homicides for the Houston PD. He calls them interviews, so I don't want to call it interrogation. But how would these conversations with him go? Like you actually go up to the to the prison in Montana um, and you'd sit with him? I did the first time, but then we shipped him back here to Denver. And uh, it was, yeah, it's myself, Gary, federal prosecutor, uh, state prosecutor, his defense attorneys, he had a state and a federal, and Scott. And we're all trying to figure out how this thing's going to work because we're just going to keep charging him with all his local crimes and federal. Is he going to tell us about these homicides? And the attorneys can't talk him, stop him from talking, even though they're saying, let us do the talking. He's like, no, no, I got this, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, and is there, I mean, I'm so fascinated by that. Is there, is there like, sm- does he say like, Johnny, great to see it? Like, is there small talk? I mean, is he like, is he sort of a, like an affable guy in a weird way where he's friendly to you and you just know that from the minute you open your mouth or he opens his mouth that he's not telling you anything that's true? After the first 15 minutes, <laughs> I took a beat down every 15 minutes and I could set my watch on it. And the first 15 are gruesome. You said I'd get a better TV in my cell. I don't like my cellmate. I want something to eat right now. And it's just this list of demands. And <laughs> the first time I was offended, I'm like, what? I'm the FBI agent. You're the inmate. You know, <laughs> I didn't say that or that would have been the end of our relationship. Yeah. But he wants to be on a level playing field with everybody. Actually, he wants to be up here. And if you're mm-hmm. not willing to lower or raise or whatever to make him feel like he's a fellow investigator, he won't talk to you. So, so you, do you have to like come in with a with a Big Mac and then get him a new cellmate? Would you have to like concede? I would at least do it. I called it doing my homework for you. I said, Scott, I did your homework. You know, you assigned me homework. I did it. I would call in the professor and then he would get upset, you know, but because he hated <laughs> sarcasm. So I was very, I'm very sarcastic, but <laughs> I, I was uh, careful when I used it because I would get the death stare if I would use it. Because he's like, if you're making fun of me, I'm going to kill you right now. I mean, he never <laughs> said that, but that's that's what, you know, came across as. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's what those meetings were. It's 15 minutes of me negotiating through the the the, the, the rules of the game. Then, then we would get down to brass tacks. I'm talking about the girls and Terry and, you know. But uh, what I was going to tell you, Joel, what changed the case is uh, I called up on that I called up on the trash receipt for Casey, called the National Forest Service. They did have a missing person, but they had not tested her for DNA. She was recovered the winter that I called, which was four years after Casey went missing, this hiker in the middle of freaking nowhere in the mountains. So I went and collected the hiker's skeletal remains. It had not been tested. I took them to the FBI lab, or I shipped them to the FBI lab, and it was Casey. So Scott's clue of national forest land and the receipt and a lot of help, (laughs) serendipity, whatever you want to call it, it's it's a break in the case that would have, I don't know that we'd be here talking about it today if those, all those things didn't come together. Wow. So you've, so take me back a half step. So who who found Casey, did you say? Uh, Hunter. The, we're just prior to the winter of 2007 going into 2008. And the body, the body is decomposed, I take it? Just skeletal remains on the side of a mountain. And it is remote, 17 miles from the closest town. Wow. So this hunter just happens to be out there, happens by whatever the grace of God or luck or whatever you want to describe it, finds us. uh, And then obviously you guys bring the remains to a lab and you're able to ID. Casey McLeod, yep. And is she the 19 or is she the 25? She's 19 old? at the time. 19. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you get that ID. Um, are you able to determine the cause of death? We're not. Uh, she was missing her hyoid bone, which is what, if there's damage to that, that can show strangulation, which is what the coroner said. So she couldn't rule that out. But the rest of her bones had no damage from like knife wounds, gun wounds, et cetera. Scott would later talk about, he always talks about in third person or hypotheticals, we think Casey was strangled there uh, based upon all these 
conf- half confessions he made to cellmates in the following this uh, recovery. So you recover this body, you obviously inform next to Ken, you do all of that. And then when do you take that information back to Scott and say, what do you know about this? We were planning on taking it back to Scott. By then I was talking a lot to his uh, mom and, and Joel, I found that not only in this case, but in others, that if you can get buy-in from parents, uh, they, they are just like Bob Markham was, had done his own investigation. Scott's mom knew a ton about it and it took her a while to trust the FBI because she didn't have a great view of the FBI thinking Scott worked for them, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, uh, I don't know how Barb found out, but I didn't. I don't think I told her. But uh, oh, it made the news somehow. Uh, yeah. The the recovery of Casey with you know, we had forty FBI agents up there. That's right, and it was oh. in the local paper. So you have all these raid jackets going up and down the mountain, et cetera. And Barb calls Scott before I can tell him, and she goes, "Hey, did you see? Because we can hear all his prison phone calls. Uh-huh. Did you see who they recovered? Casey." And there's just crickets chirping, you know, on the, on his end. What do you mean? Yeah, they found Casey Scott. And he's just sitting there. So he, he found out from mom and from the news. But then when we go to him, it's now a homicide case. So like, like the profiler told me, if you can change it, then everything changes. And so Scott then agreed. By now, I had found a fourth victim. Her name is Leanne through our investigation. Yet another 24-year-old who had disappeared and was last with Scott Kimball. How, how do you find Leanne? Like, how do you, how do you come upon her? I went and interviewed Jennifer's ex. So Scott had spent about six months in prison with Jennifer's ex. His name's Jason Price. They were here in the Inglewood prison. And Scott would do the same con with uh, cellmates. And it is like, hey, you hit the jackpot with me. I am a let's see, hitman. And he goes, if you need someone taken care of on the outside, I'm your man. I'm also good with the law and (laughs) I can do anything you want, jack of all trades. And so he'll get the cellmates to talk about how their case is screwed up and they can't get to their girlfriend and their girlfriend's going to leave them. That's a pretty common theme (laughs) when you're locked (laughs) up is you're concerned that your girlfriend's not going to stay with you. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Jason's girlfriend was Jennifer Markham. And shortly after Scott gets out, she disappears. And so I go to interview Jason uh, halfway through our investigation. This is probably right before we recover Casey. So late 2007. And I go down to Seagoville, Texas. I talk to Jason about Jennifer and he's like, yeah, I was setting her up with Scott. And yeah, Scott's a weird guy, but I think he had the best interest of Jennifer in mind. And maybe he killed her. I don't know. I've got all these conflicting thoughts. So Useless interview. He, he had no good information for me besides Scott tricked him. And I was like, well, wasted the government's money on this trip, you know, flying down here. Gary mm-hmm. was with me and uh, we called for the guard and the guard took a while to come. And I was like, well, what else? What else is going on, Jason? Anything else I didn't ask you? Uh, yeah, there, there's another guy who lost his girlfriend to Kimball. I'm like... <laughs> Holy, wait, wait, wait. Guard's standing like 20 feet from me. And I said, can you hold on for a second, please? You know, and uh, yeah. then he says, yeah, this other inmate named Steve lost his girlfriend, Leanne. He did the same thing to him at the same time that he took Jennifer. He took Leanne. So wow. it's like, and by now I'd been investigating Scott for two years. I thought I knew everything about him, you know, going through the informant files and whatever else. And Leanne yeah. had disappeared right under our noses, right while he was our informant. Was she ever reported missing? Do you go back yeah. and find? Yeah, there was a report to Arapahoe County, which is a, a south suburb of Denver. Uh, uh-huh. Right after Scott gets Scott gets out of prison, he's he's out for about a month. He's re- having Leanne write bad checks for him. He makes her think that he's going to get her back with her boyfriend, that her boyfriend's going to escape from prison. And we had texts from Leanne going to her cousin, but she wasn't telling her parents about what was going on because that you're hanging out with a guy who goes by the name of Hannibal is not what your parents want to hear, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the so, way, is that, a, um, is that a name that he gave himself or that the inmates would call the him? The inmates. But, but, mm-hmm. but his inmate friend, Steve, has told Leanne, this guy named Hannibal is going to help you. He didn't want to give his true name. So Leanne only knew Scott as Hannibal. 
Wow. And so when she was sending texts and emails to her cousin, she was saying, yeah, this guy Hannibal, he's kind of weird, but he's going to get me back with my, my true love, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, there is a missing persons report. Uh, she, she was, her car was found across the Utah state line, uh, January 29th, 2003. And dad had never heard from her. So I called dad four years later and I don't even know if she's a missing person or not. I'm saying, hey, this is before I even go talk to Steve Hawley in prison. I say, hey, Mr. Emery, this is Johnny Grusing with the FBI. I just got a tip about Leanne. Have you seen or talked to her lately or what's her status? He just starts bawling and says, I haven't talked to my daughter in four years. She's last wow. with a guy named Hannibal. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So now, I mean, in a moment like that, after you talk to the father, are you saying to yourself, oh, God, like this is this guy could be responsible for a lot more murders than I even know about? Absolutely. Leanne, to me, Joel, that was the biggest uh, not aha moment, but oh, no moment, because we had a I was working with our profiling unit, with a headquarters unit, with uh, analysts in Denver, and I thought I had a very robust timeline for Scott. And then I knew, you know, when he got arrested, when he got uh, saw here, there, and and that Leanne was snuck in there and a, a homicide victim right inside my timeline was super scary. And it was also mm -hmm. that he was manipulating two cellmates at the same time for two girlfriends. Let, let me ask you a, a dumb question, but is it like the movies? Like, do you actually put up like a physical in your office? Do you now have a timeline where you can visually look at stuff and say he was here, here? here then they're here but whatever like are you physically how do you keep track of everything i guess is my question uh we did have some actually scott told me to make him one this is way down the road <laughs> he says grusing i've never had a great timeline can you show me yours so i did one with pictures for him and whatever that that's how close we were joe you know but wow. is uh, scott but, a, was he educated was he did he go to college or anything no, dropped he, out of high school dropped out of high school but he, and the mother what's that Barb, the mother, was she also uneducated? No, she uh, ran her own insurance office. Uh, so okay. she, she was very intelligent. Yep. Uh, had a good okay. business for herself. Uh, wow. Oh, okay. Interesting. Good to know. So you get this tip on Leanne, and then now how long before you go back to visit uh, Scott Kimball? So that became part of our plea agreement. Once, once we recovered Casey... The prosecutors went to Scott along with me and Gary and said, all right, here's the deal. You killed, Car you killed Terry, you killed Leanne, you killed Jennifer. We don't know where they are. You do. We've got all of these uh, check fraud, gun charges we can file on you, but we'll trade all those if you get us to these three victims, lead us to where they are. He's like, deal. So we did the deal in court. He, he took the 48 years for all the check fraud forgery stuff. And right after that, we go to a back room and he starts sketching out where he put Leanne, Terry, and Jennifer. And then we started going on body hunts in Utah and Vail. Wow. Um, does he tell you, at this point, do you know how he's killing these people? He's talking in third person. He's saying he was, he, he only signed up for this plea agreement if we would call him the complicitor, which means he was involved in the homicide, but he's not going to say he's the one who did it. And we had, we, we would go back to the families because we're working now, Joel, on behalf of the families to get their daughters back and say, all right, he's saying this complicitor. And they're like, we don't care. We want our daughters back. They're like, okay. So you have to say, Scott, the you'd have to speak to Scott and say, Scott, um, the complicitor would have done such and such. So you have to speak to him and literally refer to him in the third person as a complicitor? No, that, that's just the, the legalese on what would come. He was so concerned and what, what would be on his paperwork when he took the prison deal. Because once you go into prison, people will ask to see, other inmates will ask to see your papers. Mm -hmm. And if, if he's the primary person that killed 19 and 24-year-old girls, it's not a good thing. But if he can mm -hmm. still be the, quote, hitman, all right, now that's something. You're, you're the murder for hire. You're the real deal. You're movie type stuff. You know? So that, mm -hmm. that's why he wanted the complicitor deal. Wow. Okay. Okay. But you still don't know how they're being killed. No. Correct. Okay. So you go on. What is it like to go on a hunt for a body in Utah? 
he had told us he could get us to both. He said Leanne and Jennifer were in the book cliffs, which are these horseshoe canyons way back off of I-70, the interstate. He goes, I can get you to both of those in a day. And then second day, I'll take you up to Uncle Terry. He's up near Vail Pass, which is a very snowy, mountainous area, you know, west of Denver. So his attorneys had worked on the all the pre-search paperwork. I had to organize uh, my SWAT team, my evidence response team. I had to get permission to check this crazy man out of jail that we won't kill him. He won't kill us. Here's all the things that we're going to do to ensure safety. It was like a bunch of typing that nobody ever thinks about. But we check him out. Nothing on day one. Nothing on day two. He's always He, he would come with a lot of confidence to the right canyon, point to a spot say Jennifer's here and our evidence team would start digging and then we would go over to Leanne's Canyon and then he would say this is not the right one this is not the right one that'd be the end of the day and then we would go back Wait, hold on. so Scott was traveling with you oh at yeah this point? in handcuffs belly chain you know like this uh, mm -hmm. and then he would get out of the car and the truck with us and go around and point to the particular spot where he would put one of the girls I have so many questions so how does this all these are the things that I wonder about so you pick up Scott Kimball from prison and you guys go now from Denver to Utah, which is substantial. Um, are you driving in like an unmarked vehicle with him? And how many people, I mean, how many uh, feds do you have to have to make sure that you're safe and that he's safe? So I'm in the back seat with Scott in a Suburban. He's handcuffed, mm -hmm. seat belted in. We have two, a SWAT guy driving, a SWAT guy in the passenger seat. Or Gary, sorry, mm -hmm. Gary was in the passenger seat up there with us because he we wanted to both be able to hear what he's saying. And we're more interested in what's he going to say during these things, you know, and how do we interpret that? Because he's going to play games with us. We knew that was going to happen. But then we have uh, SWAT in front, SWAT in back, and then we had evidence response teams, et cetera. And some of the, our SWAT guys would, like, get up around the canyon with their rifles in case Scott decided to run or do something. So, yeah, it was mm -hmm. quite the deal. And how long, a, like, how long a drive is it from Denver to this spot? Five hours. Five hours. So yep. are you are you gone overnight? Mm -hmm. Are you? Yep. And where do you stay with Scott Kimball overnight? How does that work? We pitch a tent, and me and Scott just roast marshmallow. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I check Scott back into the jail each night, like five, and then we go back to our hotel, and we would stay up till. 10, 11, just digesting how bizarre this whole thing is, you know, and what he said to us in the van and, or the, the truck and how we didn't find anything and what's our plan for the next day. Your, your mind just doesn't shut off because there's so much stimulus, stimuli, whatever coming at you. Wow. That's, that's so fascinating. And anything he says, like, could be a weird clue. So you're probably going back and, you know, he said cotton candy. Does that mean like, you know, like <laughs> all these things start uh, probably like, you know, playing, uh, head games with you. So, so you go and he, is it that he doesn't really remember the spot where the bodies are, or is he playing games or you don't know? All three of those. Uh, we, yeah. we think part of it with Jennifer, he might not have known. We, th we think that he did, but he brought us close and decided not to take us there. And that's because of what he did with Leanne, uh, with Leanne, this was on. So we started, this was about two months, uh, maybe a month after we first started, maybe our third or fourth trip. Uh, March 11th, 2009, he takes us into another horseshoe canyon. He says, if we find a waterfall, Leanne might be around that. And he's never mentioned waterfall in all of our, we've had now, Joel, I don't know, 20 sit downs with him and his attorneys to try to not waste our time, you know. And as we're walking down this horseshoe canyon, he, he seems, you know, he's given out these other clues, waterfall. He walks us up to this uh, about six feet of rock. So it doesn't really look like a waterfall, but it's in a creek bed. So he's like, yeah, that looks kind of like one. And he points down to his right and goes, there's a bone. And we look at the bone, and I relied upon the sheriffs because they had grown up in that area. They'd recovered a lot of homicide and even suicide victims out there. And they're like, oh, that's another sheep bone. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't look too unique. And Scott goes, eh, well, we're in the wrong place. Let's head back down the creek. Yeah. So he just starts walking right behind and I just stand there beside that bone, and I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do here. And I start walking up the the side. It's the side of this uh, canyon, and I just keep going. And I'm not supposed to really be away from Scott, but he's just 
uh, to say Scott's acting weird is just say Scott's being Scott. But the, mm-hmm. this whole thing was just, he seemed more certain of this area, the waterfall. And anyway, I, I can't tell you why I did it even today, but I start walking up and after about five minutes, going straight up from the bone, thinking if this bone was from Leanne, could she be up here somewhere? And I run into a gray hair clip with uh, some blonde and brown hair in it. And all I could see was a a little bit of a bone because a big rock had covered whatever else was underneath there. And I said, uh, I think I found Leanne as loudly as I could. And then my search party, the SWAT guys and Scott come back around and Scott's standing up above me uh, after about five minutes for him to get back. He's looking down with his uh, blank look and says, that's not her. And I'm like, we have been searching for months and we don't see any sign of human activity. I don't, I don't argue with him, but I'm thinking this has to be her. Mm-hmm. And my boss, Phil said, get him out of here. He's acting weird. So they get Scott out of there and, uh, we have the coroner come and the, they move that rock and her entire skeleton is underneath there. And yeah, they dig and dig and they find a bullet uh, that was uh, spent where her head should have been. That We never recovered her cranium. And there's a lot of speculation of what happened there, whether there's a, a scavenger that took it or Scott as a trophy. We don't know. But uh, the bullet matched Scott's gun that we found behind the fish tank all those, you know, years or so ago. So that's how he freaking killed Leanne. And uh, we, we send her femur in to be tested. It is Leanne. And we're able to bring her parents to the side. Her parents uh, made a little memorial there in the middle of these godforsaken book cliffs of Utah. Wow. Um, I mean, once you obviously have the proof that it's her, what does Scott say to you? I, I, I must have forgot where I put her. Like, does he, does he have some excuse as to? I, you know, he... it, and I probably talked to Scott fifty times after that. I never really addressed it. Uh, he would he would say that he, yeah, he killed Leanne, but she was going to rat on him. It was because she thought he was an informant, and I don't go into the details of why he said it's not her. I think I know why. It's because he wanted to play a game with us that day. That's why he wanted to turn around at the waterfall and go back the other way. Wow. So what about the other bodies? Uh, I know you never recovered Jennifer, right? But what about Uncle Terry? Uncle Terry was, so after we recovered Leanne, we can prove to the judge that he's playing games with us. No, nowhere. Every time he told the, our evidence response team to dig for Jennifer, it's a no-go and they would dig trenches to find her. And, we finally stopped. Phil and I had had enough. Uh, and we said, that's it. Even though his, his defense attorneys were pretty convinced he was trying and we're like, <laughs> we can't do this for the rest of our FBI career, you know? So we said, we're done. And the, the, the prosecutors went back, told the judge he's playing games and let's just sentence him to life and whatever. And so Scott's like, and then, we had even forgot about Uncle Terry because Terry had nobody looking for him. We didn't have parents breathing down our neck for Uncle Terry. He was a loner, a drifter. He had just disappeared. Everybody, the family had accepted he was in Mexico and were kind of glad to do it because he was a burden on people. You know, he didn't really. Why did you kill Terry? What was the motive there? uh, $15,000 in cash. Terry was carrying around a briefcase after his divorce. He came up to see Scott and uh, Scott had just tried to kill his own son for money, which is a whole separate deal. Uh, that's why we call this Operation Snowball. Justin was 10 at the time and had a $50,000 life insurance policy. Justin was oh, wow. in Children's Hospital surviving Scott's attempt on his life when Terry came to town. So Scott had failed to collect the 50000 from his own son and in pops Terry with a briefcase full of money. And for Scott, it was a, a cash cow, literally. So that's why Terry disappeared within... 10 to 14 days of coming to see Scott. Wow. And wait, how, so Scott, ha, the, Scott's son survives this attempt on his life. Is he, is, how's he doing today? Scott's he, son. He just spoke to ABC for the first time. Uh, it's on uh, uh, 2020. Uh, his name's Justin. He's now an adult, but Justin and his bro- younger brother, Cody talked about what it was like to grow up with Scott, your dad, not knowing he's a serial killer, but looking and putting pieces together of these awful things that happened in their lives. One being him trying to kill Justin. Wow. What a crazy story. Um, 
back to the women, is there um do you, is is there a kind of a common thread motive? Is there a sexual component to these murders? Yeah, and I know that from looking at Scott's laptop. It showed a bunch of uh, torture porn and and even some snuff type films. It's not, we didn't see the snuff films, but we saw kind of trails to them. A snuff film is where you actually see someone being killed, and it, it can involve sex, et cetera. So Scott was he was uh, yeah. I think the reason for both uh, Jennifer and Casey's deaths were solely sexually motivated. It's that they were beautiful girls, young women that he could not have, and if you tell Scott he can't have something. He's like a child who will throw a tantrum and make sure that he has it, you know. Wow. Um, did the profiler ever, like, give him a label, a, you know, narcissist, um, incel, any of these common labels that we hear? Did he ever profile him that way? So I did bring him out, and this is, Joel, how I got to the figure between 20 and 40. I uh, brought the profilers out. After Scott's been sentenced to these four, we're still looking for Jennifer. Uh, my profiler guy comes and and he and I and another profiler talk to Scott for 14 hours one day, six hours another. So 20 hours of Scott. And after those 20 hours, uh, and it's all, Scott's all just trying to impress them, be the man in the big man in the room. But he does talk about the very detailed way he would kill people and how careful he was not to leave DNA at the scene, how he made them disappear, not have a crime scene, it was ingenious, but uh, he's trying to impress them the whole time. But after we yeah. after we leave, we go back that second day. The guy said, I have listened to thousands of homicide cases, and this is the most narcissistic person I have ever heard of. So if you ask for a label, that's the closest they came, you know. <laughs> Narcissist. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, reveal uh, secrets of the trade, but uh, would he would he um, – cover his tracks in terms of never leaving DNA behind things of that nature. Was he, was he good at that? Very, very, he watched crime scene shows, uh, religiously. And not only that, he was always thinking about it. When I went to one of the profiler trainings early on, they said, well, you mentioned basketball, you know, like that's my passion. I go to work and whatever else, but I think about basketball a lot and what can I do to play basketball, even as old as I am? And then I watch the NBA and, you know, that that's a stream that runs behind. That is one of the things I love doing. By the I, way, congratulations on the Denver Nuggets. I didn't yeah, even. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yoke are you, to, are you a Nuggets fan? Cause you're a Texas guy. So no, I, 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 I mean, I liked watching them and, and now I love watching them with the way Jokic plays. He is that amazing. Oh amazing. Gosh. But yeah. uh, what, what the profilers told me is like, like whatever passions you have running behind your brain that, that you're, you think about a lot, that's killing for these type of people. And so Scott is becoming better and better with each homicide. And if he'd been doing it, I believe his first one was in 1985. And that's because of things that he told me and other inmates over the next 20 years or the next 10 years after the homicides. Uh, yeah, he just got better and better from 85 till, if you remember, that's the way he can kill two people at once and make, not only kill them, but make them disappear and make their boyfriends think he's doing them a favor and bring the FBI in all four of those things at the same time. So that's how good he was by the time 2003 rolls around. Wow. And so how do you, well then, so how do you go to the, how do you get to this? 20 to 40 figure. Um, I mean, you're going back to 85, I guess. And then um, he did it all between 85 and when he was ultimately in, permanently incarcerated. Was, whatever. 2006, yeah, between 85 and 2006. So yeah, there's, and, there's three, I'd give you three uh, research points for that. One is as soon as we could see he was a serial killer, our unit in Quantico, started researching missing or killed people in and around the times and places where Scott Kimball was. So if he's in Montana in June of 1987, did anybody go missing and did anybody killed? You know, those sorts of things. And they did that all over the country. And they gave me a list of about 20 to 30 possibles. But these were just possibles. Anybody could have done it, but Scott's there at the time. But then they would also say, once we found out, oh, Leanne was killed with a bullet, you know, to the head, then they would get more around that area and start doing that term in there. So we had our FBI list of possibles. Scott was telling inmates, even on our trips to the desert is when he started talking to other inmates about how many people he's killed. 
and about how he's leading us in circles in the desert just for fun. So that's, we also presented that to the judge because I went and interviewed those inmates. But for those, the number was 17 and it got up into the 20s and he would list homicide, homicide, homicide. He wouldn't say names, but he would say, I killed a woman by doing this. I killed a man by doing this. I killed a couple by doing this. And he gave details and it was anything from shooting to bow and arrow to strangling to knife. Uh, those, those were the main ways that he would kill them. But mainly it was hitchhikers that he would just see someone pick them up and say, today's your day to die. You know. Would he literally say that? Uh, no, because he wanted to be able to be successful. He didn't want to roll out of the car, but that's what he's saying, you know, in his brain. In his head. Yeah. Um, and did, were you, were you able to close other missing persons cases as homicides as a result of him saying all this? We have three that we're pretty confident he did, that he's toyed around with us outside of the four victims that he pled to. Uh, once in Montana, once in Colorado, once in Alaska, that he's basically said he did, but he's only going to confess to them if we give him a better, lighter sentence. And that's not going to happen. I mean, we, we've talked with the police departments. Uh, the vic there's one's a homeless guy with he doesn't even have family and then the other is uh, a woman who disappeared up in Alaska who we, he's might be jerking our chain on that one but the locals know about it as well but I, I think he's responsible for her death so this is a really dumb hypothetical hypothetically if you said hey uh, Scott Kimball we'll give you five years and you're out would he tell you would he gladly give you all forty names potentially he would and they wouldn't be true. <laughs> they wouldn't. Okay, so you couldn't rely on it. Well, because um, because the, the the third ring, you know, we did our FBI research. He's told other inmates about it, and oh, there's four. The third was he got brought me and Phil down after the profilers left and said, "I'll tell you who I killed." I said, "All right." He goes, "You'll need to bring these big map books or map map scope books, uh, and it has detail." And he's like, "All right, let's start back in the '80s." He goes, "I was just hitchhike. I was a uh, found a hitchhiker, a guy with a red beard." Uh, and he was, this is over Lolo Pass, remember this? And he said, I, I just got him, took him in the car, shot him just for fun, left him. You should find him near Lolo Pass under some leaves and blah, blah, blah. And and you look up Lolo Pass, you find this area. He's like, because he we wouldn't even let him look at it first. And then he's like, yep, right there. We're like, okay. Then he would go number two, number three. He got up to 21 with me and Phil and we kept admonishing him, like, Scott, are you jerking our chain? He's mm -hmm. like, no, I'm telling you what I did. And so it's any like a, it's the same that he was telling, very similar to what he was telling cellmates. Some were men, some were women, some's a couple. They're all just for fun, though. It's uh, nobody, like Leanne and Jennifer, or Leanne was some money, some sex. Terry was money. You know, he's not giving us motive. He's just saying, I killed him just to kill him. And I go, Joel, and I contact these 21, no, it's about 17 different jurisdictions because some had two homicides in the same one. Guess how many victims I found from Scott's, quote, confession? Zero. Yeah, there you go. Lots of confidence in me. I see it. Thank you. you know? <laughs> no, it's not you. It's the yeah, fact yeah. that he's just, uh, he's just a snake. So, um, so I go back to Scott and say, you know, I get paid the same, Scott. You know, I, and I told you, we thought you were jerking our chain. What's with the 21? He goes, Grusing, there's a truth to every one of those that I told you. This is a puzzle, and it's up to you to figure it out. So I mm -hmm. joke around. That's when I shot Scott Kimball right there and buried him in the in the prison. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> er, everything's a game to him. But uh, yeah. then that was 2011. Then in 2014, 2015, he got together with another defense attorney to confess everything, and they got it up in the 40s. And they said that, and we were doing research for them. And they were they would clue us in, and they go, oh, "We have about twenty missing persons and twenty bodies you'll be able to find." And then we mentioned, I mentioned one of these couples that I had been looking at for a long time. It's a couple that visited Montana. It's a husband and wife, and they were well to do because the defense attorney couldn't walk him into a death penalty case. She's like, "We are walking away if anything's death penalty." And I mentioned this couple. And she just like doesn't say anything. And then she's like, we're done. 
And so we never found out what he told his attorneys. He gave us a list, though, myself and the prosecutor, a list of 30-some counties where he killed people. He says, I'll give you this, but I can't give you more than that, you know, without us sitting down. So that's as far as we got. But he never went to trial. It was all a Correct. plea deal. Like, yep. Yeah. And he's he's in prison the rest of his life now. He is. No possibility of parole. Correct. And um, the reason I asked about, you know, his confessions, because if the profiler is correct, and it sounds like he is about this guy being one of the biggest narcissists out there, do you think he wants to be known as one of the most prolific serial killers in American history? I, I mean, tried say- that. I tried that every which way I could. Yeah, I was thinking he'd bite onto that. But he likes more playing games and being, and I found this out with people with narcissistic tendencies. They want to be king of the moment more than they care about future consequences. So he's got to be smarter than me, which he is, and, and in certain ways at that moment. So he doesn't want to yield also. It, it would almost be like, you know, having someone tap out on the mat, like, okay, mm-hmm. fine, I'll tell you everything. Even if it's good for him, like, no, I, I, that's not going to happen. We would, ha- mm-hmm. And he told me this one time, he goes, you have to prove a homicide to me before I confess to it. So where does Scott Kimball sit on the list of uh, American serial killers? He's got to be close to the top of that uh, prolific list, right? No, because we couldn't prove any of those those others. I mean, he's good for four. He's got three more out there that I don't think will ever get charged because no no prosecutor is ever going to give him a deal, you know, on those. So, and then the others, unless it benefits him or unless they're proven against him, he's not going to confess to them. But in your mind, do you think he has killed? Upwards of 40 people? Between 20 and 40, yeah. And I've interviewed, I bet, Joel, probably 30 inmates that he confessed to over this 12-year period between sentencing and my retirement. And if I take a compilation of all those stories, that's why I would say that. A lot of them are, I mean, he's not going to give names or he gives false names of ones he doesn't. But if you look at, maybe have a data person look at it like, you know, statistical things, it's it's in that that range, you know. And so when's the last time you uh, you spoke to Scott Kimball? Uh, 2021, I retired and I got a call from the prison. I can't imagine who that was going to be, but it was about a week before I retired and I didn't, I wasn't able to pick it up, but uh, I'm thinking he would, that was him calling me. So nope, haven't talked to him in now over two years. My wife's very happy about that, you know, so. My, Do you think you'll ever talk to him again? I doubt it. Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. And and he has no way to contact you in terms of writing to you or anything like that. He doesn't know your address or anything along those lines. Yeah, I don't know that it does anything for him right now. He would, He. would. I think I, I, I was a curiosity thing to him, and I was someone who could make things happen for him, and he liked playing these mental games with me for a while. But I think I've been shelved, you know. He's got <laughs> bigger fish to fry in these new prisons. Like I said, it's like putting a shark in a tank, and that's his world right now. And I'm I'm not going to affect that in any way. And so, uh, as you move on in your life, how how often do you think about Scott Kimball? Well, then the cases following that, which I still have some to be adjudicated. I went to trial on one down in Colorado Springs two months ago. I would I would apply the the Kimball triad of narcissism, being a psychopath, being a manipulator, and that that's called the dark triad that the behavior analysis unit works off, and apply that standard to whoever's in front of me as a, as a potential subject. And it's very effective because Scott's at the end of the scale on each one of those. And if I see those tendencies creep up in one of my suspect subjects, it was uh, very helpful to then explore that. Uh, so... Mm-hmm. Scott has Scott was as I was a criminal investigator my measuring point for those other killers that were put in front of me. Uh, today, it's I, I've you know I, I helped with Justin and Cody his kids on that show. It's you know mainly it's just regurgitating lessons learned from Kimball, but he's not mm-hmm. occupying uh, a lot of my space like he used to. I am very happy to hear that. Um, are you confident? that you could beat him in one-on-one on the prison prison yard in hoops? If he's thoroughly searched ahead of time, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, For those of you who do not know, you know him now. Johnny Grusing spent 25 years as an FBI special agent hunting down infamous serial killer Scott Kimball, 
Uh, he also investigated international terrorism, espionage, bank robberies, kidnappings, uh, special jurisdiction crimes. He's done it all. Uh, he was involved, obviously, with this high-profile case, which the children have now been on 2024. And uh, as we talked about, uh, Johnny Grusing was also a star basketball player at Texas Tech. Uh, Johnny, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And uh, I hope you uh, you never run into another character like Scott Kimball and that uh, can live a nice, peaceful life now. But uh, appreciate appreciate the conversation very much. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate your show. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks for having well, me. We'll have you back on. Hang on for me for one sec. Love you, America. Love you, Denver, Colorado, Texas, and everywhere in between.